Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here with Chris Duffin, an amazing power lifter. We'll hear all about his individual details, but Chris, I just finished your book, The Eagle and the Dragon, and how are you still alive? Like, honestly, how are you not dead or in a gutter somewhere with a needle in your arm or in jail? Uh, that, that, well, uh, it's funny, I got asked that by, uh, by uh, uh, a psychologist I was seeing a few years ago. Uh, I was in the middle of going through a divorce and uh, uh, you know, we decided to see counseling and uh, I started going through my, my, my history and he, yeah, he's like, I, I don't even understand. He's like, yeah, how was that the case? Uh, so to give you a, a little background for your audience of, of my history, it's, let's say I grew up in poverty, but it's a different time of pauper, poverty than people really know today. Because mm -hmm. you see people that are struggling to get by, but maybe they still have a gaming system or a smartphone or nice clothes, your clothes. Yeah. Uh, and you uh, grew up with nothing. I grew up with nothing. So we're talking uh, living in the mountains, uh, foraging for foods, knowing different types of mushrooms, uh, killing animals, fishing, poaching deer, uh, living in tents, living in condemned uh, shacks and shelters, um, really even, you know, there was times where we'd have a home during the school year and stuff like that, but a lot of the times, like, having a place that had running water and electricity, that was, that was pretty rare. Mm -hmm. And so this is, uh, most of the very early childhood is all in the Northern California wilderness. And just straightforward, like, um, my parents were, were growing weed for a living, and that's, that's what they did. And uh, it wasn't a very good living. Um, uh, and they really just didn't want to be a part of uh, society. That was the main thing. My mother more of a survivalist thing uh, or a, a hippie thing. Yeah, or? more of a hippie thing. Oh. So this is you know this is in the seventies and um, you know early early seventies is when they kind of started heading that direction. And then, uh, um, but yeah, it was you know kind of out of the sixties, California. You know, you know. Berkeley, San Francisco, all this stuff, you know, where they'd kind of grown up and very intelligent people. Um, but, uh, you know, my mother had some reasons for, you know, significant distrust in basically authority, uh, authority figures, things like that. And, you know, she had a full ride, you know, or not full ride, so she had a scholarship uh, to become a, a, chem a chemical engineer. And at some point in there, decided she just didn't want to be a part of the world, <laughs> part of the normal world. And, uh, so, so that was her just trying to find a way to make ends meet and not be a, a part of a, you know part of traditional society. So yeah, I mean we had clothes falling off off of ourselves. We ended up having a family of you know seven with you know living on less than five thousand dollars a year. Right. Um, so you know we're talking and like you were moving all the time, all the well. time, all the time, and uh, we're talking like taking gallon jugs you know to down to the stream filling them with water and setting them in the setting them on a rock in the sun so that you could dump over your head and take a bath and uh so living in some very very remote areas so well one of the amazing things or fascinating things about your book is when you talk about that you're not talking about how you were i mean there was physical suffering and you're just trying to sleep at 40 below with you know, no heat <laughs> yep but at the same time, it's not like you were that aware that that was that different in existence, and thus you weren't comparing yourself to the other kids, at least for the first part. For the first part, yeah. It was, uh, uh, it, yeah, it's it's just, you know, people are like, oh, that must have been terrible. And I'm like, well, it just it just was. I mean, honestly, go back, uh, you know, 100 years, 200 years, like, everybody was. this is where everybody was. So it's not like there's, you know, that brought on necessarily terrible suffering or anything like that, but there's some bad shit that happened. Um, very, I mean, you live in that environment, guess what? You're going to be walking around a lot of people with drug problems, mm -hmm. murderers. Um, there, we had a serial chiller, uh, killer that we had to deal with. There was, uh, who was a cop, who was a cop. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, and did, uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, human trafficking, uh, some really, so outside of the scope of living homeless. Yeah. There were some very traumatic things, uh, that happened and, um, and then, yeah, I mean, just within the family, a lot of, you know, drug, alcohol abuse mm -hmm. stuff that just got really worse over the years. Um, I grew up with my, uh, a stepfather and, uh, again, really intelligent person, but not really, 
adept at surviving, like <laughs> surviving in the world. He wasn't that functional and had some mental health issues that continued to deteriorate. So, you know, myself, I ended up, uh, so uh, I ended up putting myself through college, um, which I guess that's a little easier than it, you know may sound because I ended up getting a full ride scholarship. Mm -hmm. You know, I was top of my class, uh, you know, valedictorian, state level athlete, you know, that sort of stuff. Graduating high school, and uh, I got a full ride scholarship to uh, to get some engineering degrees, and I went to do that. And I I actually separated myself from my family at that point in time because anytime I would be in contact with home, it would be a request for money. Right. Uh, and, and so the like, reintroduction, all that chaos. Yeah. So I'm just like, I just set aside. I, I just set myself apart for a couple of years because I, you know, lived at another side of the state, and found out that things had gotten really bad at home, and uh, I ended up having to take custody of my three younger sisters, uh, one at a time, not all three at once, uh, but consecutively, uh, starting taking custody of them and raising them. Um, my mother had a mental breakdown. Ended up at, out in Montana, I believe. And their father just was completely incapable, and so uh, and at the same time, you were going down a potentially bad road as well. I so was, kind of yeah, recreating addiction patterns in the family. I, I was. I uh, have you have you heard about that that gene that sort of? I mean, there are more and more behaviors that are being found have genetic links. Whether it's a need for adrenaline, there's an adrenaline gene, but certainly it looks like susceptibility to addiction. Mm -hmm. it, it's got at least a genetic component. Obviously, if you grow up in addiction, with it, that seems to be normal. And but also does seem like there's probably a genetic component to it as well. Uh, it's certainly, I, I, you know, I, I, I've heard that and and I see that. I mean, it's it's been something that's afflicted my family for generations. And me and my siblings have all had you know our problems with it over the course of time. And uh, but yeah, I started down the path of having some serious uh, alcohol uh, related issues over the course of that. Were you as big as you are now, then? No. Thank God. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just imagine a 300 pound world class strength athlete uh, on the pitch. I, 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 was a, I was a big strong guy, but uh, I, I'm one of those like incredibly, I don't know, I'm just a pretty damn easy going yeah. guy. And, uh, not an he, angry drunk. Not an angry drunk. Oh. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, uh, going full mountain on people. <laughs> <laughs> I grab your skull. I crush your head. <laughs> or maybe it just didn't happen because I, uh, I'm intimidating. I don't know. Because yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was still, I was still definitely bigger and stronger. But uh, so then, how did you come out of that? I mean, was it having to take care of your sisters that then forced you away from that path, or beginning to turn your life away from that? Um, yeah, it's so a different time of life. It, it just different. Uh, so I was sitting there, and you know, I owned my own. I was twenty. I was twenty. No, I was twenty-two uh, at the time. I was twenty-two years old. I owned my own house. I was working as a as a manager at a at, at a, uh, a production facility. Had uh, two or three supervisors working under me, and close to a hundred employees. Uh, I own my own business uh, on the side um, uh, that had a retail outlet in town, and then I would take people out uh, doing like paintball games and stuff during the I had a full rental business over the weekends, and so I had a lot going on that would tell me I would be successful. I'd started lifting weights again because I'd taken a little bit of break in uh, in college. Uh, I started lifting very young, and uh, and I had my uh, uh, I think two of my sisters. Uh, no, the first sister and uh, uh, was needing to take uh, custody of the second sister at the time. But inside, I just felt like I was falling apart. Like, I felt like I was dying. And I was like, I have to get away from this environment. And I, I, I tried to stop, but I created this culture around me that I couldn't, couldn't escape. And so I quit my job. <laughs> and I drove to the other side of the state, <laughs> drove 400 miles. Crashed at a friend's house and picked up another job a couple weeks later. Mm. And uh, um, would you recommend that as an effective strategy for people <laughs> trying to get their life like making that hard cut and putting distance yeah. between you and the problem? Uh, yes and no. So um, you know it worked in that instance, but we're dealing with some pretty simplistic. I was young. There's a lot less ties and things to you know uh, to things, but there's 
there's a certain point of like, yeah, I mean, if you're surrounded with the wrong people, you've got to make those changes. And people always find that tough. No matter where you, it doesn't even matter, like trying to escape something. Like, what do you want to accomplish in life? Where are you going? You know, what kind of vision do you have? And are the people around you, you don't want yes men. That's not what I'm saying, or yes women. Um, but people that are supportive or going to question and challenge you or are trying to work with the same level of passion and intensity towards what they have as well around you. And I, I, I took a year trying to move, but it was a small community and not a very good community um, uh, just because of where it was in the, in, the, in the state. And I just, I couldn't escape it. And finally I was just like, okay, I've got to pull up ties. I said to my sister, uh, so I had been raising her for a couple of years at this point, the one that was with me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, the house is yours. You know, she had a job. She was uh, 18 turning 19 at the time. And uh, I said, I'm moving to Portland. <laughs> and uh, you know, here's a car. And I, I picked up stakes and moved and uh, got a place and uh, picked up uh, the second and then third of my sisters uh, while I uh, jumped full course into uh, pursuing kind of more of an executive career direction and uh, getting started on my MBA and, and uh, getting started in competitive lifting. So I did all that within the course of uh, about six months. Well, I'm sure we'll circle back to the upbringing because that's a pretty amazing story. But you said you, you did a bit of lifting when you were younger, but then getting started in competitive lifting, like that, that's a whole mm -hmm. other yeah. arena, that's a whole other world. Why did you get started in that? Um, uh, not a whole lot to the story, but it, it's definitely a very distinct, uh, uh, you know, memory is along with that. So uh, I've been lifting, I think I started lifting around 1988 or so, so early, very early teens, uh, mostly because I, I was, I was looked down upon by everybody else around me. I had ratty clothes falling off of me. I was the nerd in the school. I was like, you know, like, and I'm like, well, one thing I can manage is like, you know, just becoming a more physically, you know, robust person, getting involved in sports, and and uh, and that ended up being a very good thing for me, for my my self confidence, my ability to start learning to interact with other people because I didn't have that solid of social skills at that point because I didn't have a great level of interaction with people growing up. <laughs> I, 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 lived in a, I lived in a very secluded environment, so there was a lot of stuff there. So it was to me. Uh, lifting and sports were just an incredibly powerful thing mm -hmm. and uh, um, I had some uh, some injuries over the course of uh, uh, of my uh, my sport uh, my athletic career in high school that when I went to college I was in a lot of pain because we didn't have means to pay for my care so, so what was what was injured uh, the big one was uh, I separated my uh, my clavicle and tore all the ligamentation out. Um, Just at the head of the shoulder? Uh, at, the, uh, the, oh, the, at the sternum. At, at the sternum, the SC okay. joint. So, and you'll, actually you can see here, so that SC joint over here okay. on this right side is raised up. Yeah. There's actually way less, there's hardly any muscle tissue there. It's atrophy, but that's how much it's it's lifted up. So it floats and doesn't have any stabilization there okay. uh, in the center. So that being a big one, like it would, cold, just breathing in in the cold would hurt, you right. know, trying to do a, you know, a lot hurt, of things. It only hurt when you breathe. Yeah, exactly. It only hurt when I breathe. So, <laughs> so that's, that was probably one of the more major ones. Um, and uh, hyperextended uh, this elbow over to somewhere in this range. And uh, so this elbow is the worst of my two elbows that I've had surgery on since uh, with floating bodies and stuff floating around. So probably start, got kicked off right then too. Okay. Uh, but, um, so I started, uh, so I took like a couple years off when I was in college, just I could, you know, I just wanted to, I had a lot going on. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, but then I started lifting again about two years later, trying to get away from my drinking, moved to Portland and just like, you know, that was my focus was just work and training. And so I was at the gym and there's these two guys, they were prepping for a bodybuilding show. And they were bigger than me, and they looked better than me, but I lifted at the same time as them every day, and they're all in this prep for this show. And I ran circles around them every day in the gym. I did more work than them, I lifted more than them, and I'm like, well, maybe I should find like a, some sort of like lifting 
event mm -hmm. and uh, just do, do a bench press competition. I know they got bench press competitions. I'll go find one, do it, just to say that I did it. So I did. And I showed up and I competed. Actually, I, showed, I, I, I signed up and it said, uh, do you want to do bench press or bench press and deadlift? Now, reminder, this is not in the social media age that we're in today. Right. And I'm like, what's a deadlift? <laughs> well, I don't know what that is. <laughs> Sounds good to me. So, so I did a little research uh, six weeks before the event, discovered what I thought was a deadlift. Well, it was a deadlift, but technique-wise was <laughs> pretty abysmal. <laughs> I ended up in a standing position with a bar, so okay. yes, okay. <laughs> uh, so I showed up and did this bench press and deadlift competition uh, back in 2000, and uh, I got done with it, and I'm like, Oh, oh, so I'm doing that the rest of my life. Like, really? it just like clicked. I'm it resonated. Like, yeah, I'm just like, right. okay, that's that's the thing I'm doing. Do you and remember what those numbers were? And do you remember what your body weight was at the time? Uh, I competed in the 198s and I bench pressed uh, 440 and deadlifted 523, okay. which is uh, not very much. Um, given right. I'd only done it for a few weeks, but. Uh, you're Considering a I'm a thousand, I've deadlifted a thousand pounds for reps. Yeah. Like, that's a pretty good progress, I think. Uh, <laughs> pretty good progress. So my first meet was five twenty three. Uh, again, I had no clue what it was before, you know, uh, beforehand. Uh, so I just want people like deadlifting a thousand pounds. How many people in the world have done that? Like, you've uh, done it for reps. So nobody else has done it for reps. Okay. And uh, well, let's I mean, just establish that. Like, yes, you have an amazing life story, but you're an incredibly elite, world-class strength athlete and have torn up various records over the years. Uh, yeah, I've done a lot of just completely unduplicated feats of strength. Right. Um, so, right. Um, yeah, okay. so I've held the all-time world record in various lifts a bunch of times. So that's a compilation of like all the different federations because there's a bunch of them. So there's a lot of people out there that will tell you they're world record holders. They're not. So basically everybody that you meet like, right. you know, that says they're a power lifter and says, I have a state record or world record. They don't. Yeah. It's like in a federation or an age class yeah. or a, like all, and if you. On the 49th Street it, Lifting it, Federation it, exactly, and I live like, on 49th Street. It, it, exactly. Yeah. That literally is what it's like. So, um, so that all time world record means like everybody regardless, no age classes, no, like right. this is it. Right. And, uh. And as that, I was ranked number one in the world for like eight years straight. Wow. Um, and then I got into uh, exhibition, basically doing exhibition lifting, which we'll talk about why uh, a bit later. Right. Um, but uh, that's where I did the thousand pounds for reps. Um, so it's the Guinness World Record for the most weight ever sumo deadlifted. So there's two styles of deadlift, a sumo and a conventional. The, 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 well, that's, that's so five people have deadlifted a thousand pounds and right. they all have done it conventional. And they're all about... Uh, the lightest was probably around 380 pounds, and they run from 380 to 440 ish pounds. I'm a big guy. That's about 140 pounds more than than me. So I'm by far the lightest person that's ever done it. The only person that's done it for reps. The only person that's ever done it for sumo style. Um, so yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So let's just. I'm sure some of the people know what powerlifting is, but let's just go over the three basic lifts of yep. powerlifting and just because people also don't appreciate the amount of technique that there is. Mm -hmm. And I mean, in your online site, in your videos, in your Instagram, you go heavily into like the nuances of the technique. You know, how do you yeah. position your diaphragm relative to your pelvis? But most people just think, big guy, I, to bench more, I need a bigger chest, which probably helps. Yeah, yeah. no, it definitely helps. Uh, but yeah, a lot of people don't appreciate the nuance or the biomechanics and things that happen through the entire system. And it's not just powerlifting. Like, mm -hmm. as a company for our education, we teach these concepts to a lot of the major league sporting teams that you watch on TV. Right. Like, we go in and why are they, they're not paying for powerlifting education. These are basic, fundamental human movements. That's why we focus on them from a, from a, a, a squat. A squat is, you know, breaking at the, uh, uh, the, 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 the hips and knees simultaneously until you know the, the hips go below the, the, the knee, okay? Um, one of the bo most basic human movements, okay? Yeah, you need to pick up your groceries when you're 80 and you need it That's to... That's a deadlift, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, so like it's, these are the most basic patterns, okay? 
And in those, we learn how to stabilize the spine uh, appropriately under load to buffer against those stresses, to be able to elicit power from the ground th through those power generating uh, areas, which are the major con contributors are the, the, the hip complex and the shoulder complex, okay? And be able to translate that to some sort of distal end, your hand, right. okay? Throw in a javelin, throw in a baseball. It, the, pushing somebody on the football field. Sure. Uh, it, it doesn't matter, it's all the same things if we break it down. And these ones are the most simplest. So that's why we like to start there sure. because now you can translate that to everything. So powerlifting is a squat, just getting down into a squat position. We see a lot of people you know, in that position, not much in the world anymore, but it's sitting down on the couch, sitting to a toilet, uh, usually not the way people sit on a, to a couch appropriately, but. Uh, now, uh, and then the next is a bench. So basically pressing something away from you. In our instance, it's pressing a barbell while you're laying on a bench. Um, a little bit unnatural because we're disconnected laying on a flat bench. Um, in our system, we teach it as a whole body system connected to the floor, which then brings a lot of the stuff back that then again translates to basically all of their sporting application. So a ground-based movement where you're, you're standing mm -hmm. uh, and able to translate power out to an end through the shoulder complex, okay? But bench press, you lay flat on a bench, you take a barbell down, touch your chest, uh, wait for a press command, press it up, wait for a rack command, goes back in. And then the deadlift, probably the most uh, important skill to master as a human, because this is picking up a bag of groceries off the ground, mm -hmm. picking up a child, any of these sorts of things of just getting to the floor, or close to the floor and being able to pick that up. Uh, in our case, it's a barbell. The bar's in front of you, you walk up, reach down, grab it, uh, and then hinging, the, so basically the, the torso and the legs at the same time, we're going to hinge those just like a hinge would open or close and then drive those through to completion uh, through hip extension. So, and so then your best of those three uh, lifts is added up and that gives you your powerlifting total. So what was your powerlifting total? Uh, my typically, uh, my uh, well, it, uh, <laughs> that's a little hit or miss. It's all over the place. Uh -huh. So, uh, uh, twenty one. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, two thousand and sixty was my best. Okay. So yeah. So that's your bench press plus your squat plus your deadlift. Yes. So I imagine trying to peak at all three at the same time is difficult. It is three yes. different motion motions. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, and I've got some long-standing injuries that I talked about from sure. childhood or training for 30 years that made like competing uh, in that environment under those rules a, a little challenging. For example? Uh, well, I talked about my broken elbows. Right. Um, so full lockout on the bench would be difficult? Uh, it would definitely be difficult and actually touching my chest is okay. really difficult. Uh, just like I actually have trouble eating. So like I can't get my arm to my face or my head to wash my hair. Uh, these sorts of things. So, um, and then if I have to uh, deadlift, you're not allowed to wear straps in a competition. Um, the bar is going to sit six or seven inches out in front of me on one side, which is going to be a pretty horrendous on the spine and the associated shoulder joint. And then stack up, training that, and then training a squat and training a bench, and it becomes a little challenging. So I was just basically not able to demonstrate what I was fully capable mm -hmm. of. I imagine that that's a problem that pretty much every elite lift, no elite lifter out there has no injuries. Um, I, I wouldn't say that no elite injury really? has no injury. Yeah. So um, you've got to consider, I, I've been at this, like the guys I was competing against were 10 or 15 years younger than me. Okay. I didn't, I didn't really hit my peak until much later because uh, you know, a lot of people I was competing against, that was what they did. They competed and maybe they were a trainer or owned their own little gym or something on the side. Like that was their priority. Um, and I had a lot more going on in my life uh, than most of the people that I was competing on in that level. So it took me a lot longer mm -hmm. to get to that level. Well, I have two things. I mean, the so I was in my late 30s when I was, you know, peaking uh, as a competitive athlete. And, you know. Doesn't strength peak later though? The first guy to it, squat a thousand pounds was. 40, if I recall, like yep. Fred Hatfield. Yep. Uh, yes and no. It depends. So it stays with you much longer. And yeah, it, the neural adaptation definitely seems to really 
um, does seem to come into place in that 37 to 42, 43-ish time frame, and even into the mid to late 40s for some individuals. Really? Um, That's so, when they peak? Uh, some of them, yeah. Yeah, it's not uh, not uncommon. Like right now, I'm still I, I'm at my strongest. I just don't feel like putting my body through the abuse anymore to work through a certain set of rules to demonstrate to other people. I just want to do. So, so my thing is, I've been wanted how many pounds today? Uh, Eight hundred and sixty-five. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, abuse on your own terms. Uh, in my own like using, like if I use a set of straps, I can put a neutral grip both sides, and I have no stress on my elbows and shoulders. Okay. Uh, if I use a duffalo bar, I reduce and eliminate those stress, those stresses. Mm -hmm. uh, but you couldn't use that bar. I can't, I can't because these are the rules. Sure. We've always had a straight bar. That's just what we do. Sure. There's no reason to, but that's what they do. Sure. Okay. Um, so I was just at a point that in my life I was tired of competing. I've been doing it for 16 years, and I've been, you know, at the top of my class. I've been. At that point, uh, training for over 25 years, and I just didn't have a passion for doing it anymore and decided that I wanted to do what excites me. Yeah. But it's that simple. So there was a, but there was a distinct turning point in my life around a lot of things in that, at that period of time. So. so what excites you now when it comes to lifting? I am chasing what I call the grand goals. So um, this is, I, I started this actually when I uh, retired from powerlifting. Um, I said, uh, you know, I explained this in a big YouTube piece because I knew there would be a lot of questions mm -hmm. about what are you doing, why are you getting, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I explained this and said, you know, my goal is to, uh, to, uh, to uh, deadlift a thousand pounds. And I ended up doing that for a triple. And uh, so I think I insinuated at the time. that back a second because people may have missed it. Yeah. So deadlifting a thousand pounds, as we talked about, is a giant deal. Yep. And you did it three times. Yes. At the same time, like one, yes. two, three. One, yeah, and, As in, and no, and no one's ever done that. Yeah. Well, actually, I didn't lock out the third, so we can call it two. But and I didn't. I didn't two and three quarters. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so it'd be like somebody running a I don't know, but four minute mile, and then we'll just only do that two and a half times faster. So yeah. running like a one and a half minute mile. Yeah. 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 So. Uh, so yeah, I did that, and I think I insinuated, I'd have to go back and look at the video, I might have insinuated that I, uh, at the time that I might be chasing a thousand pound squat, which was indeed the plan. So uh, my goal is to be the first person in history to have both deadlifted and squatted a thousand pounds. So there's, I don't know the number of people that have squatted a thousand pounds at this point, it's probably about a half a dozen. There's five other people that have deadlifted uh, uh, a thousand pounds, but no one is close to being able to do both so because they have, no. The, the, the frame, the bio, like these, the 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 limb links, the attachment points, like all these things that play in the role to make a great deadlifter, usually makes a difficult squatter. So, for example, so, long arms would be good for deadlifting. Yeah, like that would be a classic example. Yeah. But what are some other things that would make a great deadlifter that would make a crappy squatter? And you can go totally granular here if you want, because it's really uh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a. Uh, it, it, it's it's a little hard to uh, articulate unless I really spent some time like uh, diving uh, diving into there, um, but uh, you'll see. God, yeah, I I, okay. I think it, I'd need to think on it a little bit more to like give you a very but historically. It's no question. The guys who are good at squatting are suffer at the deadlifting and the other way around. Yeah, okay. usually you don't find somebody that's and that's and that's what I'm trying to demonstrate with this because. There's a, a lot of people, they see my deadlift. Right now I'm known as a deadlifter. Right. People don't realize that arguably I'm a better squatter than I am a deadlifter because I've been doing it for a while. Um, but they're like, you're built, you're just perfect, uh, you know, limb, you know, uh, you're, you're, you're short and you have perfect limb links. And I'm like, you guys are watching a video. I don't know what, you, what you're talking about because I'm 5'11 and I have perfectly normal wingspan relationship. So mm -hmm. there's a, uh, you know. Uh, you are the Leonardo da Vinci man. I, I am like, just like completely average. Like there's no outline at all on this. So, um, but what people miss is my deadlift like looks so short. Like it looks like I'm not moving the bar because how clean the movement pattern is. Mm -hmm. I can actually make it look like I'm moving twice as far by you know extending through the knees faster than 
then trying to extend through the hips and then have to recover torso position over the top of the hips versus this perfectly clean execution of hip extension at just the right time so that the, it, it just looks like it doesn't, the weights barely move. But they still have to travel the exact same distance, sure. so um, there's just very little wasted movement in it. So how is the hunt for the thousand pound squat coming? Uh, well, I just hit eight sixty five for a triple today. Um, that's a personal best. That's a personal best for a triple. Congratulations. Um, which is good to be back on that. My my best uh, for reps. I've done nine hundred for a double twice in the past when I was doing a lot of squatting, and I'm just getting back. Kind of well, not just getting back. I've been training pretty heavy for four or five months on it right now. And uh, so, yeah, I've got at least another 135 pounds to go. Um, but uh, uh, some of it's just mental. Um, like today, my first repetition was my hardest. It was my slowest, and it really took a lot out of me just because the fear factor, like walking up to that much weight, putting it on your back, you unrack, and it just it feels like the, it's going to just crush you, right? And you're, you're going down, and you're like, is my something gonna explode, you know, like all these thoughts. And if you think these things, your lift is gonna suffer and you're actually gonna potentiate those things, those bad thoughts. Yeah. The outcome of those bad thoughts are highly potentiated by you actually thinking about it instead of just executing. So I've really gotta make those shifts to get back into, um, you know, get those things out of my head. So today was all about handling a heavier weight, a heavy weight, hitting some reps, hitting a PR, even though I know I'm capable of more than that right now, but I don't think I would have hit it because the mental game, I needed to, to accumulate some wins and really get some momentum so I have that confidence um, that I can get a nice, clean descent and get a really great uh, you know, spring out of that from the uh, uh, loading of the muscle and get that, uh, that elastic response. Um, but that's, that's where I'm at today, so all part of the process. Yeah, no, it sounds, uh, sounds incredible. It, it, it's a crap ton of weight. <laughs> it, it's it honestly it's it, it's scary, but you've got to um, you've got to uh, you know become comfortable with that, and that's uh, some of the philosophy of the stuff in the book. So yeah, um, you know, getting back to that, like we've been talking about my story growing up, and I, I really want people to understand that the eagle and the dragon is not like a a book about like oh. Here's me, this is what I've accomplished. And we haven't really talked about what I've accomplished besides some lifting stuff sure. so far. Um, I think I cover, in the book, maybe three pages, actually, on yeah. the lifting, because there's a lot of other things I've done in my life. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's really well, about... Why don't you talk about the symbolism of the eagle and the dragon? Because it's, it's a bit of a strange name yeah. for a book. Yeah. But it makes total sense when you explain it. Yeah, I'd love to. Okay. So, um, so I have, and I had this tattoo done, so there are two tattoos on me. Uh, one is of two eagles. One is covering my, 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 my stomach, trying to fly away. One's covering my back, same thing. And if you follow them, the, each eagle's shackled, and the chain runs down my leg to a shackle around my ankle. And I had this done around 20-ish years old, uh, right around the time I took custody of my sisters and was kind of starting to get moving with my life. And it was, the, the meaning behind that to me uh, at the time was you can fly to whatever heights you want in life. The only thing holding you back at the end of the day really is yourself. And so it's about realizing your strengths, realizing your capabilities, and also separating your identity from the things that have happened to you. So there, there could be horrible things that have happened to you, and that's, that's fine, it's gonna affect you in some way. I'm not gonna say it's not gonna affect you, but it's not you. You are defined by your responses to those things, right? Um, can you it, give a personal example here? Like, I think that's a really important point, but can you drive that home? Like, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, we'll use, uh, uh, well, yeah. I mean, you had a difficult relationship with your biological father. I yep. think that's fair. Um, but you're not defined by that. You've presumably made adjustments in how you do your own parenting. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, that's a, that's, I cover that quite a bit in the book. Uh, but uh, I'll just cover it a little bit more theoretically and then maybe move into sure. uh, some examples there. So it, it, is, it is very much like your identity is your choices and actions as it results to that. Um, let's say you have something very bad happen to you, okay? Um, 
like, well, I'll just use something very simple. Um, an accident happens, okay? You get hit by a car. In my case, uh, late last year, I completely detached a hamstring. So I'm squatting with only two hamstring heads instead of three. Um, and I've got to deal with that. Uh, that doesn't define me as a lifter. I haven't mentioned it up until now. And the only reason I mention it is because it's a, an example. So you could be walking around being saying, I'm the guy and I, I did this with my arm. I'm the guy with the broken elbows. Again, you know, some, some, some examples there, things that have happened. Um, but I've taken that and turned it into something completely different. I've taken that and said, I'm going to create my own platform for how I execute my goals working around that and at the same time use that platform to raise money for charities that I believe in and have a tremendously bigger impact on the world because I got fucked up elbows mm -hmm. and I can't perform at my highest level with that sport. Right. Okay. Um, so now you're, you're or I can wallow in pity about my hamstring and go, <laughs> I can't do this, I can't do that, but I'm just done and you know, like, move, you know, it, it, there's so many things there and those are really easy examples from, you know, we talk about sure. more, you know, uh, again, the mental side of things or, you know, relationships or, you know, more traumatic uh, emotional things that could happen to you in life, but it's, it's still that same process. What are your choices and actions? And that is who you are. And that's how you separate yourself. You don't want to be the person that when somebody asks who you are, you tell the sob story yeah. because that means that is your definition of who you are. Your definition is not even defined by yourself. It's defined by these other things that you had no control over whatsoever. What do you have control over? <laughs> your thoughts and your actions. Yeah. Okay? So, um, so that's the first part of the book it is all about how to work through it. And that's why every chapter in the book has a story but then works into themes yeah. and how to actually put that in place. It doesn't tell you how to live your life or you've been through, through it. I was very particular about making sure that I didn't put any morality around like what I, how I believe people should leave or what their mm -hmm. uh, live or what their goals should be or, or any of that. It's, it's all about asking the questions for you to dive deeper on these, these thought processes to help you understand what that and, and really create a vision. And so this kind of leads into the second piece is creating this vision of who you want to be and how you want to be impacting the world. And by the world, I mean your people around you, whatever sphere of influence that you want to have. Um, but is what is that vision? Okay, and I think that's really important for people to to understand. And and because I see so many people, especially like on social media, oh, here's my bucket list, and here's this like, you know, how do I do time management to a to get more done? And the, you know, like, and it's like that. No, like, like I need to do this. To, you know, it's all about the hustle, and I got to get this business started. People come to me that all the time because well, I own four different businesses right now. Um, it, you can't go there unless you know who you want to be, where you're going, how you want to live. It's not about the money. Why do you want these things? Why do you, because they mean something else. And so you need to ask yourself why repeatedly, just diving deeper to really establish those, those pieces. And so the second half of the book is related to a tattoo that I got done about 20 years later. Uh, and this is the dragon. So it's, uh, you see any videos or pictures of me, you're going to see this very big dramatic dragon running across my chest, my shoulders, my upper back. Um, and it runs around and it's eating its own tail. It's an Ouroboros. Okay. Could snake, dragon, whatever that's eating itself. Sounds a little morbid. Um, yes. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> got but, on my shirt. but it's the, the purposeful reinvention of oneself. It's eating the old, becoming the new, infinity, all these sorts of things, right? And uh, so for me, it's the purposeful reinvention of oneself. So we're moving beyond like discovering, you know, your identity, your strengths, and all these things that can help you move uh, towards success in life to purposeful reinvention, okay? Specifically deciding who you want to be and becoming that, that person, okay? So like the book, for example, to me is just a story. That's not me. I'm who I am today. 
none of that past stuff. I that's just a story to me when I tell it. Yeah. When I you know, uh, it, it 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 I can use it to articulate points, and that's what I did in the book. Yeah. Um, and that's the reason it's 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 a story that I can use to articulate these philosophies, but it's not who I am. Mm -hmm. Who I am is that last couple chapters of the book yeah. um, that defines... Well, ten years from now, it might be somebody different. might be somebody different, yeah. yeah. And, uh, so, and, and so that's, that's, the, uh, that's the second half of the, the book, is, is the, uh, the dragon and the philosophies, the philosophies around that. So, yeah. And that's uh, tied to, for me personally, like I was a highly successful uh, executive. They bring me in to turn around companies, sometimes turn around and get it sold. Um, grow a company from like a regional to a national to a worldwide presence, like just operational stuff and uh, um, the operational excellence, world class performance. I mean, that's mm -hmm. I believe uh, right. if something's worth doing, I don't do a fifty million things, but I do them to a very high level, and that's just my personal beliefs, right? And I think I it's can... in the very end of your book that you're talking about cutting away stuff that it for achieving a goal is not yes. about adding stuff; it's about Removing, removing the extraneous, it is. The extraneous stuff. It is. It's your your so, sculpture. So your when we understand movement. our vision, right, now it becomes much easier to go, oh, how do I, okay, these goals, I can create the set of goals that are going to realize this. Okay, now I've got that. Now, what doesn't fit in that in my life? Chop it out. Hmm. Remove it. It's extraneous. And that's how you'll find big momentum. All of a sudden, you'll be getting these huge things done. That you never that, that that weren't moving before. People come to me all the time wanting to know my time management skills. My time management's horrible. They're like, man, you must work, you must sleep like four hours a day. I'm like, no, I sleep nine hours, ten hours a day, and take a nap every day as well. Uh, like, but what don't you do? That but what I don't do, do exactly. Don't, me, what What are some things that you don't do? Um, what does Chris not do? <laughs> well, I get I, that's making assumptions on people's lives for the most part. Sure. Uh, but. Uh, um, I'm assuming you don't watch a ton of television. I don't okay. watch, yeah, so I don't, I don't, don't watch much TV unless it's like personal time with my wife. Sure. So, and that is part of a, a really, so it's not like, I'm not saying not to do these things, but understand why you're doing them. We shouldn't be using it as a filler, as a gap, as these sorts of things, right? Um, so, like, I have a process for, like, a that, you know, my, my process is actually, to not really evaluate, but is to remove everything. Everything, and then find out what you have to do. It's much easier to do that. Start with a blank slate. Completely, yeah, rip everything out. So like, I, I did this, this is how I was really successful as an executive. I'd come in, whoever was doing it had been failing their job, the company's bleeding money, people want to leave, customers want, you know, like, like when I was running the aerospace company, Boeing was ready to pull the plug and find new suppliers, and. Uh, and uh, I come in and I didn't do anything because I had to evaluate what needed to be done and who clearly whatever was being done before me wasn't effective. But you always run in these environments. People are filling out reports and doing this and doing like it's busy work up the high hell. I could be working seven days a week, 14 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not going to do that. Um, but you remove that and then decide and find, you'll really quickly find the stuff that has to be done. Okay. So. Step one is eliminate. Just freaking eliminate it. Okay? Yeah, I don't watch much TV. I don't watch football on Saturdays with everybody else. I'm not going out to bars with my friends. I'm not playing golf. I'm not, you know, there's, there's, there's a whole lot of things I, I don't do. Right. Like, because um, everything I do is really aligned with the things that I want to do right. uh, with my life, with my family, um, and uh, executing that vision, right? So step one is eliminate. Everything and the best way to do that is just pull everything out really quickly. You're gonna find out you gotta do laundry, okay? <laughs> There's stuff you gotta do, right? But th that'll that'll come to you, okay? Then it's how do I automate that task? That's step one. How do I take this from something that I have to do to that it's just it's something that takes care of itself? Like, and a lot of times you'll find that you can automate things. Okay, uh, definitely more so probably in the business environment necessarily than sure. your personal life. But like, put your bills on auto pay. Put you know like there's a lot of there's a lot of, a lot of stuff there that you can 
remove off your plate of micromanaging and micro doing if you take the time to figure out how to do it, okay? We're putting some process in place for doing it, okay? Um, and then the last is, okay, if I can't do that, how do I delegate it, okay? And uh, so that's the, that's the three-step process. And then if it doesn't make that, yeah, it's something that you've got to do. All right. Um, but this is all focused around time. So, yeah, uh, you know, like, I've got somebody that comes and does the deeper cleaning on my house every couple weeks. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take care of the normal daily stuff that I can do as part of my routine. Um, and, uh, you know, things like that. So those are a couple easy things in your, your personal life. Um, but it's... Uh, it's a really good process to play with because I, I trust me, you will get so much more done by not doing things. But first, you really got to understand where your you vision, going? where are you going, right? Establish goals that are aligned with that, and now figure out how to now. Now, but your goals are the same way. If your goals are ten different things, you're going to be going. Then you can't eliminate anything. Yep. My goal but is to. That's why yeah. creating. Here's one, the one or maybe Here's two the things that I really value in life. I. I value security and stability, okay? How do I get that? Well, make sure I'm not, you know, I'm not in debt. <laughs> uh, make sure, you know, I've got, like, there's a whole list of things. And like, oh, those, some of those are tied to money, okay? Some of those are tied, you know, like, okay, now what goals do I have that can help me get there to have that value of stability and security? Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, if I don't understand that, I could have... Just internally, if I never think about this, security and stability may be high priority for me, okay? And just internally in my mind, I process that as, not my mind, but, you know, uh, the back of my mind, sub subconscious. I'm like, God, if I had a mansion and a fancy car, clearly I would be successful and secure and stable, right? <laughs> right? So I never think down my values and I create a goal. I want a mansion and a fancy car because that's what my head's telling me. I don't know why I want it. I haven't done the work to, to find that, right? So, because I don't know why, I go get a high interest car loan, I go over leverage myself on a mortgage, and I get my mansion and my fancy car, and I have moved the farthest I can away from security and stability, because I didn't understand that. My values, right? So this is, this is why it's important to do. You can totally fuck up mm -hmm. if you don't have that right approach. And you can course correct. You can, yeah, yeah. It, it's yeah. just something there's a lot more work to get the shit yeah. back on there. People are gonna kill me if I don't pick your brain a little bit more about strength training. Okay. So I, did, um, I think I'm old enough to remember just the tail end of coaches for sports telling their, their students, oh, you don't wanna lift weights, it's gonna make you slow and it's gonna make you, you know, have prone to injuries. And, I think we're well past that as a society now. Uh, uh, not, I mean, I, 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 work, I, I work with a lot of uh, professional uh, sports teams and collegiate teams. Collegiate's usually pretty solid. Uh, professional, still, uh, a lot of the position coaches um, still actually have that, that have been in the, in the game for a long time, but they're overruled because that's not really their, their place. But sometimes it's, it still struggles where maybe it's the, the head coaches and then they're influencing the strength coaches and so on. They still have it, but they're, they're having a negative influence on it. So it's not completely removed. I think there's still another generation there to, to move, at least in those environments, but yeah. So, all right, I, I, it's fascinating that it's still there. I, I, I know it is. At this point, the onus would be on those people to prove <laughs> with data yeah. that it has a negative effect. Let's assume that we're not dealing with that. Yep. Uh, because that's a whole other argument. Let's assume that we're trying to come up with, you know, make some recommendations about starting a strength training program for the, you know, average athlete. There is no such thing as the average body. There's no such thing as the average athlete. There's no such thing as the average sport, or maybe just the average human being. You're a power lifter. Would you recommend powerlifting, or what would you recommend to somebody who's not completely crippled, right, but wants to get stronger, have less injuries, perform better? Maybe, I don't know, whatever they do at the running club or the jiu-jitsu club in my case or uh, uh, on the softball pitch. Yep. So there, there's a couple things there. It's really, again, diving in and understanding uh, what, your, what your goals are because it could be a little bit more metabolic focused. Mm -hmm. 
um, you know, because a lot of people say, hey, I want to lose a little weight and feel better and have greater energy levels. Or again, you know, adding uh, adding some resilience. Like let's say, uh, this kind of counter, like a lot of people like a bicycler, why would they need to do upper body training? Mm -hmm. Well, try some downhill biking and take a crash and see what happens to your shoulders. Yeah. Like strength training is about creating resilience. We adapt to stress and become more resilient. That's what strength is, okay? So if we understand that, then it helps us like apply whatever principles that we want, okay? So we wanna, uh, we, we, we wanna understand that. We also definitely want to master basic positions, basic motor patterns, okay? Ba basic movements or basic? Basic movements. Okay. So the ability, number one, to be able to establish and control and stabilize our spinal position and be able to transfer power effectively through that, okay? And there's a lot of ways that could do that. Um, but if we get too focused down like up here, and again, these are not necessarily how a bodybuilder would train necessarily or whatever, because it's, <laughs> everything's a, all kind of <laughs> mixed and depends on a, you know people's individual approaches. But if we take the buffering of that uh, out of the system, we're going to re not train that result. So we can develop all this strength, but not be able to translate it and then potentiate risk. So we wanna fundamentally have some level of what we call axial loading. So that would be a downward load through the spine, okay? Regardless of whatever the athlete is. So why is axial loading? So I can see it for like, for an older generation, red osteoporosis and stuff, mm -hmm. and, but it doesn't sound like that's primarily what you're talking about here. Um, no, that's uh, that's part of it. Um, so yes, definitely bone. So um, this is actually, you can pull research that shows uh, 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 deadlifting has a regenerative process, uh, uh, impact on um, on disc related injuries. So flexion intolerance, the actual contrary to what everybody the, 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 the vertebrae, like all of it actually has a positive influence. It actually uh, increases the density uh, of the vertebrae, which sounds like well, what what value of that is? But if you don't. If you're in a slightly flexed position, you've got the disc in between, which is more of like a jelly-filled uh, piece. If it, if you don't have enough density in the disc, it'll compress, and then you've got that disc not aligned properly, and then that's when you get your protrusion or your uh, uh, herniation, uh, which then we've got a whole lot of issues, right? right. So axial loading is really important. You got to pick up bag groceries off the ground. How many people in like some rudimentary, you talk back pain in the general population, okay? It's be huge. It's the number one healthcare cost in America. Let me say that again. Number one healthcare cost in America. More than cancer. Cancer, than diabetes, heart disease is back pain. Wow. That's why. That's why I put that as number one. We've got to have some level of axial loading. So it's not necessarily just loading the spine, but it's also how we use the diaphragm uh, in opposition to the pelvis to stabilize that. It's not, people think about uh, the erector muscles and all these other like, you know, pieces of the puzzle is like uh, in moving the spine. Yes, they move and articulate the spine, but actually stabilization comes from a completely different set of, uh, of processes. Not completely different, but the majority comes from that. So it's the intra-abdominal pressure. Yeah, creating of uh, intra-abdominal pressure. So that you say that's the most important aspect of stabilizing the spine? Yes. Okay. Um, and there's a lot of things when we do that that happens as well with uh, so basically right. the guy wire system uh, that supports the spine as well. Um, but that is the that that kicks off the that that kicks off the process and has the biggest impact. Um, it's creating pressure against all the, the organs and all the surrounding tissue around the spine as well. Those muscles that that actually uh, work between the facets all the way up, uh, they're really small. Like if you look at it and go, oh, that's not picking up 900 pounds where mm -hmm. that wasn't holding me in position when I squatted 865 today. There's not that much muscle there. Um, so being able to use that and buffer and manage this. And so pick something, track bar deadlifts, squats, like some of these basic patterns where we've got to use the joints on either, so either side while maintaining spinal position, number one, priority to have some of that in your training. Now the amount of, now what's involved in your life depends on how much of that becomes a priority. 
Um, so, and then we want to work on basically developing power around those two complexes around it. Uh, a good thing to think about. Shoulder and hips. Shoulder and hips. Uh, a good thing, we, we think about things in a, uh, in a vector approach. So axial loading is a downward vector, okay? Um, and we've got front to back vectors um, or mixed vectors, okay? So a mixed vector would be a little bit of uh, a barbell row. Mm -hmm. So a barbell row, I'm bent over slightly, and we think about it as training the, the lats, mm -hmm. you know, because that's what's significantly engaged. But in that slightly bent position, I still have some axial loading going on. So if I want to have axial loading in my program, that could be it, and I could be developing the back. So understanding, you know, what those balances are uh, with your needs in life, if we think about that vector approach, uh, because we get this, we see these big gaps of people that they go, um, I need to, I need to train my, I need to train my glutes um, for, for hip extension to help me with whatever it is. Um, or I'm a rock climber, all I need to do is pull ups. Yeah. Because I'm climbing this way. That's maybe the opposite of powerlifting, right? As opposed yeah. to lifting stuff off the floor, you're pulling yourself, your <laughs> axial, your but we, we want to we, we want to balance the, those on the other side of the, the joint as well, so you're going to want to have some of the other. But where I was going with that is we see a lot of people like um, not understand. So like uh, the hip thruster is a really good example. Great movement, but if you think about, are you familiar with the, the hip thrust? No. You put a barbell on the hip and you extend the hips. Uh, with uh, supported here, feet on the ground. Okay, I use a great well, movement for a jujitsu specific thing. That's why I started doing okay. it because it improves your. I think it's carry over the bridge. Most people doing it are doing it in search of a bigger booty. Bigger and, and bigger booty actually do, it does work for that. Um, but a lot of people do it because they think it's going to improve their squat or their deadlift mm -hmm. or other some some other. Like, I'm using those as yeah. the easiest examples. Sure. Uh, when it is not an axial loaded vector. Right. What is it going to help you do front to back with the glutes? And the research validates this. It's going to make you run faster and jump further, this front to back vector and use of the glutes. Okay. Okay. So even though it's training the same muscle, muscle, it's not doing... The loading is it, different. It, the loading is different. So it's really important to understand this stuff as we apply uh, kind of our methodology, methodology to it. Okay. Um, I don't know if I'm answering your question very uh, specifically because well, you're like, I, you, you know, you're looking for here's a program or a, uh, well, I, which is, that's, that's difficult, but it, I think it is because that's, we, you know, as a, that's what we do is we analyze everybody individually. That, that's our approach. We don't really do templates, approaches, or anything like that. It's like, well, what's an the, athlete's the, the, the takeaway here is you need some kind of reasonably heavy axial loading. Yes. That's, however you accomplish that. I mean, just for fun. life, yeah, and yeah. definitely for mo it's going to roll over into most sports. See, I was saying initially that we've moved away from mostly coaches going, oh, you shouldn't weight train if you're a baseball guy because it'll slow you down. But we are still at, oh, you've hurt your back. I've hurt my back. I shouldn't do any lifting like that. Ah, uh, yes. So we're still there. I know. And that's fact, where my back injuries have all gotten better because of weight training, not the other way. And I've been I, like you, absolutely. you know, like bound in the bed where it takes 20 minutes to roll over to the side to pee in a jar, and then 20 minutes to roll back, and that's agonizing. Yep. Oh, and I've had some high-level lifters uh, like that have uh, been told, oh, you've had a back injury, and this is literally just a couple years ago, I want you to not do any squatting and deadlifting for a year, okay? Let your back heal, and then you can get back to it. And I'm like, well, let's think about that for a minute. Why did we hurt our back? One. We're not using these resources appropriately, mm -hmm. okay? So we're not gonna use them, which means we're going to get weaker for a year and not learn what we did wrong and now go back to lifting again. What have we done? We've just potentiated a worse injury. Because now I still don't know how to move appropriately and use those resources and I'm weaker. I'm less Resilient. To, I mean, this is the whole point of but strength in your training. Mind, I'm, I'm, I deadlift 500 pounds. <laughs> so now you're going to be trying to get back to that without. Yeah, but you're. Yeah, you haven't dealt with the root issue, yeah. and you're weaker, which means you're at a higher risk for injury. For sure. I mean, that's the whole point of strength training, and we see, like, and that's the whole point of like why Kabuki Strength is here today. I started a YouTube channel, well, 
2007 ish because I got so frustrated with some of this this nonsense out there um, you know that people were were promoting in that regards of like like if we we've got to move well and then we've got to move well with load and that develops resilience and there's no reason that I'm broken because this information wasn't available when I you know 25 years How did ago. you break the arm uh, <laughs> uh, so combination of things um, I lack mobility in my shoulders like I said there's probably some trauma from the high school event sure. um, but I lack mobility in the shoulders um, and so I was compensating by going into extension uh, during a lot of movements uh, particularly the squat to be able to get into position because I didn't have the level of external rotation or movement of this proper movement of the scapula okay so that caused me both a disc herniation and excessive stress on the elbows okay so that's a squatting injury that or basic part cumulative I have a nervous system disorder that I, I now know that I didn't uh, know at the time uh, I don't feel the joint pain or there's a lot of things I don't feel um, and so if I had sensation, I won't ask your, I won't ask your ex wife about that. <laughs> if I if I had sensation, it probably wouldn't have got to the point okay. where I was completely like my arm just quit working, and I had to go into the doctor, and they're like, "Yeah, your your elbow's gone." Like, how you not? I'm like, how you not in pain? I'm like, I don't know. Got surgery done. What's this name of this condition? Do you know, or like, what do you know? What's behind it? Uh, because there's people who don't feel pain. Yeah, so that's uh, that's the next level up from where I'm at. Okay. So, and they, uh, those people are, have hugely shortened lifespans because they're like they don't realize their hands on the stove as yeah. they're talking to you. And and not just that, um, uh, it causes so those people don't sweat at all. Um, okay. I barely sweat. I don't know if you saw, but I, you, you walked just in. Finished a heavy workout. I just finished with 865 pounds, and and a lot of times people make fun of me because I I'm never wearing shirts and stuff in my videos. I think it's like you're cooling off. I don't. I overheat like so fast because I don't. I, I sweat, but barely. That's bizarre. Um, yeah. And so there's a lot of issues, but uh, uh, how did you so wrestle? The, and how did you run cross country without dying uh, <laughs> of heat stroke? Ah, uh, good question. So that's why um, that's the biggest impact on the short length span is uh, heat stroke. Okay. Uh, electrolyte imbalances, uh, overheating, all this sort of stuff. So I'm really diligent at trying to manage these things. Uh, is getting later in life and actually discovering this. So yeah. I actually didn't find out. We did surgery on this elbow, we did surgery on this elbow, I detached two pecs in here, did surgery on both of those, I had three implants uh, put in, surgery on those, I've detached multiple muscles from the bone, not one instance that I ever use a painkiller. Hmm. I'd walk out of surgery, you know, and as soon as the stuff wore off, you know, they give me the prescriptions of the Vicodin or whatever, I'd never take it. No. And they're like, you're gonna be in pain, like constant pain. I was told that this would hurt me every day for the rest of my life. I've never heard, had any pain. So it's a, it's a, it's a problem with the autonomic nervous system. Um, so, but that's why it affects um, uh, the, uh, the electrolytes and sweating and right. heat and all that stuff because it's more of the organs. So like deep pain, I don't feel. I don't, so even, like, I don't even want to start talking about the weight cutting that you were doing for powerlifting, uh, which is... That would, knowing that now, that was a very, like, it, we're talking like almost 40 pounds of weight cutting in what, 24 hours? 24 to 30 hours, yeah. I mean, lots of people have died from that. Yes. And not people with, you know, uh, weird yes. electrolyte yeah. problems. Now, I did a lot of work that other people didn't. Like, For I, sure. I had, uh, I had, uh, God, what was it? Uh, I had a potassium ion meter right. uh, that you measure, like, soil with, but uh, I had the percentages so I could draw my blood. And, uh, or no, that one was off saliva. There's a whole lot of stuff. Like, I'm, you know, I'm, very particular to details, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, engineering nice mindset comes to play. Yes, uh, this, so like you know, I'd have an IV. I would learned to put my own IVs in, and I'd have it sitting there in my arm the whole time I was cutting weight. So if something went wrong, I had my IV bags I could hook up and just pull myself out of it. Did any like I was sure I knew the danger of what I was. You doing. did something incredibly dangerous as safely but, as possible. Exactly, but now I'm like, oh shit! Like that was even more risky than I thought. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and it didn't like some of the one of the last weight cuts I did was in uh, Australia. That one was in the book, and I don't think I discussed this in the book. But uh, this was one of my first experiences, like being with another group of. This was the top people in the world, and they were all cutting weight. And we go into the sauna together. Was it Australia? Because I read Austria when I was. I read oh yeah, yeah, it was Australia, right? So uh, so we go into the sauna, and everybody's just sweat dripping, pouring off their face. 
And a couple guys look at me and they're like, you're not sweating. I'm like, no, we've only been here in a half hour. It's not gonna happen for like, start happening for a couple more hours, right? And they're like, I'm like, oh, I'm like, no, I'm like, I don't like. Your core temperature is going through the roof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't have a thyroid anymore too. So that's been an out, but thing. Wow. Uh, so I burned up my thyroid. Not the result of the weight cutting, but the result so of- So you're on the medication yeah. for that. So yeah. you take the synthetic thyroid. Yeah. So many places we could go with this, but the, uh, do you think that that nerve condition helped your lifting in any way? That like, do you not, if you go do a really hard workout and I go do a really hard workout for whatever our levels are, whatever percentage of our personal bests are, do you, I mean, I'm trying to, I don't want to write off the hard work you've done, but do you feel less pain doing that than I do? Probably. Okay. So I, I've definitely learned like, there's definitely things like I don't feel. And then there's, I've definitely learned over time that I have, um, yeah, uh, much higher pain tolerance as a whole than most people. Okay. So yeah, that, that plays a role. And then there's definitely the neurology aspect of like everything that I do for this type of training is more neurology focused about right. than, than muscular uh, to be able to, to do that sort of stuff, right? And so- Because other guys your size, presumably if you biopsy your muscle would be a certain density and yep. a certain number of mitochondria per cubic inch or yep. whatever numbers we want. And the amount of sarcomere density. Yep. But you're able to use more of that muscle than they are. Yes. To haul it. So, again, so this is just this is just theoretical. Sure, sure. But um, so I'm working with somebody to dive deeper into some gene testing and other mm -hmm. actually happen to be based out of Vancouver at huh. uh, UBC. Okay. Uh, but uh, uh, that's really yeah, We're also working on some adamantium bone lacing, it's, it's, it's a Weapon X yeah, project, yeah. but I can't talk about that. Uh, um, but the, the concern, and this is where I'm at in my life too, uh, is that part of the why I can lift and do some of the things is my ability to, to tap into um, uh, being able to turn that on, but not being able to turn it off. Turn what on? Um, tapping into more neural drive. Okay. So, uh, for instance, like I can walk out and barely lift 800, but with some focused meditation, not necessarily meditate, it's a little bit of a meditative state. Um, I can feel like the adrenals release, the hair standing on end and all this like stuff that happens. You don't have to slap yourself in the face, you just, it's all internal. Okay. Um, and then I could walk. I could walk over and triple nine hundred. Like that's how big it is. But the concern is, and so there's, uh, yeah, the, it's the candle burning too bright. Mm -hmm. Like I can't continue to do this year over year, decade over decade, and not expect some sort of ramifications. And which I've already had some with like my thyroid and whatnot. But mm -hmm. what's next? What's behind that? If if I'm basically on way more than my my body, my organs, like everything can handle, mm -hmm. uh, then they should be. So I've got to get more into the the learning to relax and meditative and stuff. The other end of it. Um, so that's that's where I'm kind of focused after the uh, completion of the grand goals is how do I calm and. Because it is something that it definitely has an impact on this stuff. Mm -hmm. As we're as we're pulling the research on, uh, so anyway, the the professor I'm working with has a whole whiteboard on me of, mm -hmm. of like all the different like chemical interactions that are happening and all the others like as we try to dive that dive down this process. So anyway, well, that's a whole. It'll be really fascinating to talk to you in five years' time and see so, where you're at and yeah. see how your complete dedication to half the yoga, <laughs> doing 18 hours a day of yoga, or, or yeah. long distance running, or whatever it is that you turn your mind to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what do you find most relaxing, like just as we're finishing up here? Like uh, when, you, when you are all amped up, how do you then try, uh, I try to turn that off? I, I work with my hands. Mm -hmm. So you saw my rig in the back, yeah. um, and really that's an execution of like, the other part of Kabuki, we talked a little bit about like coaching, mm -hmm. education type stuff. Um, but you we build a whole bunch of super cool strength equipment. Yeah, incredible way to try it. Yeah, it's and it, there's nothing like what we make in the world. It's no. it, we improve human by like these things that I talked about. We 
we work on like taking the difficulty out of it to get the body in the right position, remove stressors around just things that we're used to dealing with uh, because the equipment has been designed without that thought process in mind mm -hmm. of getting the joints in the right position, getting the engagement patterns working, getting like this stuff to happen the way that the body's meant to function because it doesn't work right with this whatever contraption or barbell that we've got, right? And that started because I just like making, like obviously I've got an engineering background, mm -hmm. I've ran engineering teams in aerospace, automotive, high tech, all this sort of stuff for decades. And I had my own machine shop and that's where I like to, to, to do things. So if I'm feeling that, like I'll go out and just zone and be in the zone working on my rig, um, like the rig I'm building that's complete ground up, design basically the the axle suspension like everything is like all custom engineered and built on this thing um that's it's literally the only vehicle in the world that's going to be like it <laughs> uh, <laughs> you the dune, uh, or you, it you can, uh yeah you can do high speed uh high speed desert dune jumping the most extreme rock crawling in the world that you want or drive the kids to school uh, roll it off a cliff. And the uh, coolest car of all the so, parents. You win the so, coolest parent award. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it looks pretty epic too, which is why it's called the War Rig, because awesome. <laughs> that's what it looks like. It's a Mad Max inspired ish uh, type thing. But uh, uh, that uh, that's that's my space is just getting in that creative space. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm talking about creative with my hands as well. You know, it's mental and, and physical and just that that flow. Yeah. And once I get there, I'll be and I'll get. I forget to eat. I forget to like. I'll just be working. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that's uh, uh, that's my. Well, people should check out those things. I mean, it sounds like I'm pitching it, but it's <laughs> it's right over there. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's like a couple hundred feet or fifty feet from us. Um, like I've got to get my hands on one of your trap bars. The uh, the, the bar that you've built for squatting, I mean, so many people who start squatting, especially if they don't have a lot of meat on them, they find that that really impinges on their cervical mm -hmm. vertebra, and like, ow, oh, this hurts, and they start using more and more padding, and it screws up the weight balance, or the, the but the, the curved bar that you've built, that you've done a lot of your Yeah, the, the duffalo bar, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, that just feels comfortable. Well, that, that's what it's, it's, yeah, I mean, it's literally designed so that it removes that external load on the, uh, the external rotation, which is really hard to get that to maintain, then allows us to engage the, the lat, which the lat is a spinal stabilizer, right? Mm -hmm. So if we remove this uh, extra stress, we have a huge pull on this bicep tendon insertion in the shoulder. So a lot of people that have shoulder pain while they're pressing don't realize it's actually from their squatting that aggravated it. They feel it at another time, okay? But... Then the, uh, the external rotational demand throws people into extension a little bit. So now you've increased uh, lumbar disc uh, uh, yeah, issues. That makes sense. Right? So, so we take all that out, um, and it just feels amazing. Your squats feel great. And then the angle in it uh, also, uh, when you go to press, um, causes a uh, 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 deviation. I call it ulnar deviation. But... Deviation of the wrist that actually seats the shoulder in the, the, the right balance of internal and external rotation uh, to remove those stresses because all of our pressing related injuries, rotator cuff tears, pec tears, you know, AC joint issues, all this come when we, when we lose control and get into too much internal rotation while, while pressing because a straight bar is going to throw you, it has a huge uh, internal rotational bias and you have to forcibly work against this and anytime you get close to fatigue or uh, failure or or a weight failure, intensity failure, you're going to lose that ability. And it's ever so slight. And all of a sudden, you won't even feel that the joint's in a different position. So we get that in that position and then allow an extra greater range of motion with that improved joint centration so you get a greater training effect. And one that's more applicable to sports because we're developing power behind the shoulder instead of in front of the shoulder. The list goes, like, yeah. that's one bump. Like, Again, the, the transformer bar, like it's the only bar in the world. It looks a little bit like a safety squat bar. It is, that's one of the functions, is a safety squat bar. Meaning, but, so for people who don't know, this is kind of like a, a bar with the weight offset, so it, it mm -hmm. kind of rolls on your body and then two handles in front. Yep. So, um, but let's differentiate that just for a second. So, um, because the safety squat bar is really poorly designed. The handles are way up here. What does that do? Doesn't put us for success with the engagement of the lats once again. So watch anybody that goes to failure on a safety squat bar and you will watch every single one of them will fail at the TL junction. 
because they don't have good stabilization because they're in this weird rack position. Two, aggravates a lot of people with uh, cervical issues or post, uh, the, it's sitting right on the, the main nerve that runs through the trap. So if you don't have a big buffer there, it can aggravate that. Ours is actually formed and rounded that goes and distributes the load over the trap. We bring the handle down into position that you can actually engage the lats. And go, the list goes on, there's a whole bunch of other stuff. But then, then we take into effect, we can actually move the weight in space. And I'm like, why would you do that? Well, uh, I'm not sure how many coaches or whatever that uh, listen, watch your show, but like you have somebody that's struggling with uh, maintaining spinal position while squatting. What do you do? Put a, a, a kettlebell on their hands and have them do a goblet squat. Cleans all up. The front load cues great core activation. The diaphragm, it aligns. You don't get into extension. So we, like all this stuff that we want to coach, and you may not even know how to coach, gets fixed, okay? Then all of a sudden, additionally, the weight is in front of them, right? So this stuff happens, but a lot of people don't realize the weight didn't move in front of them, their spine actually moved behind them because the weight is still always over your mid foot. So we've allowed more spinal uprighting to happen. Okay, so we've actually manipulated spine position. So you could take an athlete that's got the huge like knee caving problem, uh, going into flexion in the hole, all this sort of stuff, adjust the bar because I do this with like NBA players, uh, MLB players, some of these ones with just like, they're not built to back squat. Like, we squat with a straight bar because it's been around forever. And so you have the, these athletes that just get in horrible positions. So their training is highly ineffective. And their injury risk is, like, huge. They try to jam the their right? square peg into the round hole that is like, the bar. Here, let's adjust this. Boom. All of a sudden, no coaching whatsoever. You're going to have an entire group of athletes, like, squatting perfectly, mm -hmm. which is why it's gone wild throughout those circles because that's huge, especially MLB. Like they get all these uh, uh, kids out of the Dominican Republic, huge amount of like uh, sports specific training. They have zero strength training. So now you got this person, if you add some strength to them on top of their skill, they're gonna do extremely well, but they have no experience in the gym. Mm -hmm. And so you're gonna have to be there coaching every single one or use the proper piece of equipment that makes that happen yeah. and boom. Like, so anyway, uh, that, that's what we, that's the way we, and, and, and then we actually can change the recruitment patterns, posterior versus anterior based, or getting more of both uh, with a lesser weight. Uh, so we're still getting some axial loading, but we're not overloading. Uh, and, it, yeah. Well, people I'll go on a rant. Yeah. Yeah, people, yeah, yeah. People should check out your Instagram because you can see a lot of these toys yeah. in action. Which is Mad Scientist My, Duffin. Mad Scientist Duffin. I definitely encourage you to check out uh, uh, Kabuki Virtual Coaching. So that Instagram is where we post uh, daily educational content on movement. So there's right. there's videos by our coaching team dropping on there every single day. Right. Um, I interact on Instagram and LinkedIn is uh, the two places I'm at. I have some Facebook pages, but I don't spend any time on Facebook. Um, and, uh, and obviously your main site, KabukiStrength.com. Kabuki yeah. Um, so that's uh, our, all of our equipment, education, incredible resource. We've got a, uh, a video library on there as well. So all the free content plus hundreds of other videos uh, that, are, that are private basically is all on this indexed video website. It's like $11 a month. Incredible resource. There's over a thousand videos on there and you can go, hey, um, uh, how do I open up the thoracic region? Search by thoracic, boom, all these videos walk up. Soft tissue, corrective exercises, mostly corrective exercises, but we've got a whole soft tissue line of equipment uh, and we walk through the videos on that stuff there as well. Incredible resource. Awesome. Um, and then, uh, or you can go to ChristopherDuffin.com. That's my personal one. You'll find uh, my other projects, Barefoot Athletics for human to ground interface products, uh, Build Fast Formulas for evidence-based uh, clinically dosed supplementation, um, and, uh, the book, The Eagle and the Dragon, free download of the Audible uh, on there. Oh, I didn't know that uh, was as well. So I paid for it, and it was free. Well, <sighs> if, if you, it's free if you sign up for an Audible account. Oh, okay. uh, so if you already oh. have one, then it's one of your credits. Right. So uh, it's totally <laughs> worth it. Okay. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you. That was awesome.